want to I want to thank uh, a lot of people. I want to thank all of you for giving us the opportunity to have a sabbatical when uh, some dear friends of ours. Okay, so I'm going to tell a little bit. Some dear friends of ours and the board work together to um, give us that time away for recharge and refresh. But I want to say this, that sometimes even strong people, and I'm going to use my husband as that example, have a hard time asking for help. Or they ask for help, but they don't really know what that means. And so for um, our dear board members and church family to come alongside us, give us time for Tom to recharge and refresh and, and focus in prayer, fasting, counseling, conference attendance, it's been great. Um, for those of you that thought I was on vacation, I assure you I was working full-time at Intellectual Ventures in Bellevue uh, doing that commute, so I was still doing my day job. Uh, but I am glad, as Patrick said, to be home. Um, this morning, Tom is in Victoria. He came back from Kansas, and a couple days later, he had received a few months ago an invitation to go to Victoria for Symphony Splash. It's one of their big music festivals on the island. And um, what Tom is doing is he's leading a group of young people from four different churches, activating them, training them, teaching them to pray for people's salvation, deliverance, and healing. And so they are invading Symphony Splash with all of that. Also this morning, Tom was um, preaching at Stu McKenzie's church. He's a member of the ACOP, a dear brother. Um, who attends conference with us, and Tom was preaching the sermon there. Yesterday, I'll give you one highlight in Victoria, Tom said that they were reaching out in the park, and they were praying for people to get healed, and they accidentally wedding crashed, an Australian wedding, and they got to pray for the groom and the best man, and they both got healed, and people were charged up. Amen. Um, I also want to say that Kansas was very empowering for Tom. He's going to be meeting with the board, and he really has high hopes that some of the board members will go to the School of Identity and spend some time there because the more that we can be integrated in doing what Jesus does, the better. Um, Tom's doing great. I want to say this. Um, thank you, Anna and Patrick. Thank you, David Lugo, Angela, Kateri. Mike Shaw, thank you. Thank you, Margaret Rose. Thank you, Angela. Thank you to every single one of you that I didn't name. Thank you, Patrick, for covering us while we were out. I heard that there was great preaching coming out of this pulpit while we were gone. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you, church. Thank you, Gail. Thank you for every person. Thank you, Stephanie O'Loughlin, for filling in for my adult Sunday school class. This is starting to sound like the Academy Awards, isn't it? All right. <laughs> but most, I want to thank my producer. And I want, no. I want to th yeah, I want to thank my producer, not just Mama, but I want to thank my producer, the Lord Jesus Christ, without which he's all of our great producers. None of us would be here today. And I want to welcome Leah back today who's visiting. And I want to welcome our snowbirds, David and Noel Crawford. Thank you for coming. And thank you, Ernest, for visiting. Thank you. All right. We are small in number, but we are great in power. You know, God is crazy. I heard Graham Cook say this sermon once uh, on a DVD I had, and it made me laugh, and you guys will too. God is crazy. Obviously, God's strong suit is not math. Because when Gideon had to go out against, what was it, 10,000, God said, your army's too big. When he even had 1,000, he whittled it down to like 300. And Graham Cook was saying, uh, you know, can't you imagine Gideon and the team going, God, uh, you're crazy. The math doesn't work out. The odds were already stacked against us. But I want you to know, when Tom and I visited three other churches that are in the North End that are about three to 400, maybe 500 people strong, a four-square church, a full gospel church, Assemblies of God church, um, I don't want to bash those churches. I will tell you, all three of those churches were preaching the word and well. But what I noticed, church, is that I missed all of you because they were preaching well, okay? I was taking notes in one of them. The music was very well performed, but the people 
and I mean this, the people sat unmoved. I watched, I felt, I'm not even Trevor Harris, and I felt like I was, I'm not David Lugo, and I felt like I was one of the most, David Lugo, thank you for preaching, like a Pentecostal, because I was raising my hands, and God forbid when the preacher said something that was resonating with the Spirit, I said, amen, and people were like looking, and they all had lattes, they were all caffeinated, so I knew they were awake, but... <laughs> I felt bad because one church, it has 500 people. Their operating cost, they put it, they were transparent in their bulletin. They're a successful church. One year operating cost, 1.9 million. I thought 500,000, you know, 600. I thought, Gail, what could we do with 1.9? There'd be more than just banners and a few, you know, not, no. But anyway, Tom and I came away with this. And before I start the message, I just want to say we missed you. I love that our church has all races, all ages. I love that. But Tom and I came away with, we love our church, and we came away with this. Is God interested? Because this church, they had 1.9 million that had about 400 people. They have six sets of pastors. They have a program going on every night for recovery group, for young people's group, for elderly group, for married couples group, to home cell group. And I thought, Lord, those things are good. I don't want to take away from those things. But Tom and I were like, Lord, is that what you want for our church? Now, I'm not saying God doesn't want infrastructure or that God doesn't want to do things. He does. But Tom and I both came away with, Lord, you want the focus not to bring the sheep in and keep them in the sheep shed. You want us to go back out. You called the disciples to be with you, then you anointed and appointed them to go back out to do the works that you did. And so should we put our money into the building to make it more attractive and offer lattes? That might be nice. Maybe someday we'll do that. But, or is it more important that we use the money towards missions, towards outreach, towards empowerment? And so we got a lot of food for thought. And I'm not saying we have all the answers, but it was very educational. Now, I want to say this about Patrick's announcement about, um, well, today's Communion Sunday, but we were talking about the international dinner, and he said, don't bring hamburgers from, you know, Carl's Jr. or anything, but I want to say Mike Shaw, who hails from the great nation state of Texas, amen, you can bring barbecue, because that is a food from your nation state. Kateri Grissel, Mexican food. Please do not keep the barbecue away. In fact, I'm encouraging that. All right, because Texas knows how to barbecue. All right, David Lugo, Puerto Rico has beautiful food. Love their food. All right, um, my, my lesson today is called By Invitation Only. And it's God's call for intimacy with his people. And I know we've all heard God wants us to be intimate. And you know what this world has done? This world has taken the word intimacy. Oh, I've got another one up here, Mama. Thank you, Mama. She's a mama. See? The world has taken the word intimacy, and they've interchanged that for sex. The closest that most people in the world will get to understanding intimacy in any relationship will be from sex. Our God has so much more for us. Sex in the institution of marriage is God-ordained. It's a blessing. But sex in and of itself is very limited, just a narrow portion. Hey, even the totally worldly Madonna said, hey, when she says, express yourself, it's one minute what you do between the sheets, what do you do with the rest of the time? Well, even a worldly, debased, pop icon can tell you it's this fraction, a small fraction of what intimacy is. But God thinks intimacy is important. And I had an attorney who has a, what you would call a sexual addiction. And I was talking with him one day a few years ago, and I still work with him here and there. And I said, I get it. And he said, you get what? He was from Texas. <laughs> what do you get? I said, John Doe, I'm going to use that name. John Doe, I get it. I said, you don't know how to connect with other human beings or God 
And so you use sex as a substitute. And you know what? He could have said, you're fired. He could have said, you're going to HR. But he had started the conversation, so I felt safe about HR. He said, you are absolutely right. You get me. And I said, yeah, I do, but God has so much more. All right. How important is intimacy? Well, let me say this. It was important enough that in the very beginning, the book of Genesis, it talks about God walking in the cool of the garden with Adam in the beginning. In the beginning, God desired to have communion, and today we're going to celebrate communion, which is another word for fellowship or koinonia in the Greek. But even in Genesis, at creation, God was seeking fellowship. Notice the creation wasn't seeking it. God took the initiative. How important is intimacy for God and his people? God's always yearned for it. He still does. Going into some of these churches, the music was good. The preaching was good. I'm telling you as a teacher, it was good. Nothing heretical, nothing weird. It was good. But more than the performance, more than what we say, more than what we do, he wants to have a relationship. And I think where we have failed as a church and as Christians in general and in our marriages is we say, yes, I do in marriage, or we say, yes, I accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. And the relationship, like every single relationship you will have, including your relationship with God, if it's not tended like a garden, it will grow stale, and there will be weeds that crop up and insects and things to take away. And God is saying to his people, I don't want a Christianity that performs well. I want a Christianity that loves well. And when the love of God, thank you, amen, I'm in a Pentecostal church. When you love well, you will perform well. That's why Jesus could say to Mary, or excuse me, to Martha rather, Martha, you're busy, you're encumbered, you're strapped with a lot of things. You're distracted with serving. But Mary's chosen the better part. She's chosen to make worship. Thank you, Scott Daniel and worship team. She has chosen to make worship the priority. I long for our church to enter into more of this worship because it opens the gates to intimacy. When you're with your wife or your husband, I'm going to be honest, I have been married 29 years. June 25th was 29. Tom and I, I will be a real wife. I'm not going to say, oh, Tom's just so perfect. Better yet, I'm not going to tell on Tom. I'll tell on me. I'm not so perfect. I'm not high maintenance in some ways, but in other ways I am. He's not so high maintenance. Well, he is high maintenance. <laughs> He's not here. <laughs> but I can also say he's very autonomous in a lot of other ways. My husband does a lot of things that a lot of husbands can't or won't. And he does love Jesus. For all his peccadillos and all mine, we do love the Lord. A lot of you out there, you have marriage problems. You have problems with your kids. And psychiatrists will tell you, and the Word of God will tell you, it is not because of conflict. How important is intimacy with God? I'll tell you how important. Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. So you and I are always praying this erroneous prayer. God, remove the conflict. Deliver us from evil. Lord, take us out of this. And the Lord's like, I am delivering you from evil through it. Like the Hebrew boys, you're going to go through it. And as my sister Gail taught, like the Hebrew boys, you can go through it and come out without smelling like smoke when God ordains it. But you are going to suffer tribulation in this world. But Jesus doesn't leave us there. He says, but be of good cheer. Why? It sucks going through the furnace. It's hot in there. You know, I'm, I, I don't like going through the barbecue of life. I like eating barbecue. I don't like going through the barbecue. And God says, for me to say, well done, good and faithful servant, we can't serve you up medium rare. you got to be fully tried through the fire, right? But God says, be of good cheer. Jesus says, why? Because I have overcome the world. And greater is
is he, which is Jesus, that is in me and you than he that is in the world. Why am I joyful in tribulation? Is it because I'm a masochist and like pain? No, it's because I know that when I come through the valley of the shadow of death that threatens to kill me, that what's really going to die is my carnal nature. And when I come out on the other side, Jesus told us, he said that I have tables spread for you in the presence of your enemies. A table spread that I have spread for you where your cup will run over, where I will anoint your head with oil, and where you will declare like David did that surely with confidence of a surety I can say goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Not only will goodness and mercy follow you, but that word in the Hebrew means they will overtake you and run you down. I don't want to be like Wile E. Coyote, you know, the cartoon, where he, gets, he goes after Roadrunner and he ends up falling into his own trap and he buys this lousy Acme products, rocket launchers, and he ends up getting crushed by the rock that he tries to have fall on the road runner. I don't want to be that, but you know what? I do want to get run over by God. I need to get run over by God. Because sometimes when we go through those things, that's when we get the closest to him. You will find your closest, deepest, most intimate walks with your loved ones, with your friends, with Jesus, when you come through things together. Every couple, every family, every Christian is going to go through some things. And we say, Lord, life would just be better with the absence of conflict. Now, Sometimes we bring things on ourselves, and we can help those things. But sometimes we're going through a trial. But Jesus says, be of good comfort, for I have overcome the world. How important is intimacy? It was important enough that in the beginning, the very first book of the Bible, it's highlighted that God walked with man in the garden. How important is intimacy? In the Last Supper, what we know as the Last Supper, it was merely a Passover celebration. And Jesus instituted a new celebration. He said, now, in his final, final hours upon the earth, he says, when you take communion, he says, I want you to take communion and do this in remembrance of me. Now, I know we celebrate communion for what Jesus did for us at the cross, and that's correct. But even more importantly, remember, it's about relationship and not just performance. He says, I don't only want you to remember what I did. I want you to remember me. Communion, fellowship, that last supper meal, that communing, who was there? All 12 of them were there with Jesus. That means Judas, who would betray him, Peter, who would deny him not once or twice, but three times. Thomas, the doubter. Matthew, the tax collector. James and John, the guys with the temper. And everyone else that would forsake and flee from him. They were all invited to come to the table for fellowship. And the whole point of the meal was not bread and wine. He said, it's to remember me. How important is intimacy? Jesus upon a cross with bloodied arms, bruised, broken arms. On a crude wooden altar known as the cross, with arms open wide, showed us to even in suffering, even when we rejected him, even when we spat upon him, even when we were unfaithful faithless, useless, worthless, steeped in sin. He said, come. And to the thief at the one hand, he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Even upon the cross, Jesus was making a gesture to all mankind to come unto him, an invitation to be intimate, to know him. How important is intimacy? Let's look at Revelations 22. Verse 17.
Revelations 22, 17 says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that hear say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Now, the context of this is it's the end of time. And the bride and the spirit are beckoning all who are thirsty, whoever hears, come. And then there's another verse right afterwards that says that Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly. And the response of all humanity, of all creation is, Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus, come. All of creation, I want to point out how important is intimacy with God. It was in Genesis. It was highlighted at the Last Supper. It was highlighted at the cross when we received a new covenant based upon new and better promises. And it's mentioned in the book of Revelation from beginning to end, in all the critical moments, God underscored intimacy. Now, earlier I shared, intimacy to the world has its limitations. According to the world, intimacy implies being close and familiar, having an affectionate or loving personal relationship with another person or a group. It's a close association. It's where you have detailed knowledge about someone or something, a deeper understanding, and it's a quality. There's a quality about being intimate. It's about being comfortable or warm, private, close. The people you're intimate with, they know more about you than the people in general. But however, that's not what God wants. Yes, he wants you to be close. Yes, he wants you to be familiar. Yes, he wants you to be loved and comfortable. But beyond that, biblical intimacy involves two parts. The ability and choice to be close and loving. Notice that? It's the ability and choice. God says you have a choice. In the book of James, he says, draw nigh to me and I'll draw nigh to you. He promises. But you have to draw nigh to him. He's always willing like the prodigal son saw. He's always willing. Secondly, biblical intimacy, besides being close and loving and you making that decision, is the ability and choice, this is the hard one, to be vulnerable. Intimacy requires that you be honest and know yourself and be honest with yourself, others, and God in order to truly share yourself with another including God, for it to have significant meaning. Some people spend all their life with an image. There's personality orders based on that, too. But Bible intimacy means that it's not always a warm, fuzzy feeling, but it's an honest, gritty, real, authentic, genuine coming together that has to involve vulnerability. Jesus on the cross was the ultimate picture of being intimate. He was stripped naked, arms wide open. I can't think of a more beautiful, more poignant picture of intimacy. So God wants that, and we see that it's important because it's in the first book of the Bible, the last book of the Bible. Jesus says, have communion, have fellowship, have this kind of intimacy, and every time you take communion, I want you to remember me. And on the cross, He says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. But he shows us again. He's beckoning us in. Now, I said that in marriages, it's not not conflict or the absence of conflict that's going to determine whether your marriage fails. Now I'm going to talk to you from the natural realm. I've had my share of conflict. Have you? In any relationship, let alone your marriage, I have. With God? with friends, with church members, your church family, with your blood family? No. What psychiatrists and what God says is true. We as human beings are myopic. We're short-sighted, nearsighted. We look at the wrong side of the problem. We say, well, I'm arguing with my spouse, so we're going to divorce. Or my family's going to break up because we're fighting. That is not the problem. The problem is we don't have enough intimacy. They said a couple that's struggling, the arguments, all that happens 
because the couple isn't sewing enough into the intimate parts on the good side. People have thrown walls up. We got into fights. So now I've got my wall up. We've got defenses up. We have all these weird coping mechanisms to keep people at bay. And then we get into more arguments, and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. But God says, the more you know me and the more I know you, the more one you and I are, the stronger you are, the stronger the relationship, the sweeter the relationship, the stronger the marriage. In Revelations, that verse we just looked at in 22, 17, where the bride and the spirit say, come, Jesus echoes that in John 7, 37. He gets up on the day of the feast and he stands up in the middle of the synagogue and the Son of God says, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. You have to be thirsty. The title of my message, I said that it was by invitation only. Does everybody know what it means when you receive an invitation that's by invitation only? It means only who is specifically listed on that invite, who's on the invitation list, can come. In other words, they don't bring any guests. Unlike some of our potlucks where <laughs> people don't sign up and they show up or they bring 10 people, God wants us to come to him. And the reason it's a limited engagement by invitation only is because he spells out who he wants. Let's see who those people are. Who is on this exclusive invitation only list? Who is it that God wants to come to him and spend time with it? Who does God want to be intimate with? Matthew eleven twenty eight twenty nine. 29. Those who labor and are burdened. Matthew eleven twenty eight twenty nine 29 says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. There's no prerequisite. He says, come. And where are we to come? Unto him, unto me, Jesus says. And it's not a command. I looked up the word in the Greek. It's not come unto me, I command you. It's an invitation. Okay, Mike and Kateri, they're very hospitable people by nature. When somebody invites you and it's done in a very gracious style, you sense the warmth that's behind it. Jesus isn't saying, I command you, come unto me if you're tired, if you know what's good for you. God is saying through Jesus, I invite you. Choose life. Come to me. If you have been taxed with exertion, work, if you've been struggling, if you've been legalistic, trying to do all these good works, God says, come to me, and I'll give you rest. So he's inviting you that are burned out, you that are tired, you that are burdened, are taxed. Who else is on that list? Isaiah 118, sinners. Come now, Isaiah 118. Come when? Come when? Now. It says today is the day of salvation, so if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts as they did in the wilderness. The Lord in the Old Testament said, come now. Don't wait. Stop trying to clean yourself up. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. You know what that tells me? It tells me that God says, come with your mess. That's Old Testament. Do you know in the New Testament, the book of Hebrews, that it said that God chose priests because the people were ignorant and out of the way and didn't know better? Look it up. Look it up in Hebrews 1 through chapter 4. God appointed priests because people were ignorant and needed guidance. And then Jesus became the great high priest for all of us that he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. We don't understand. Jesus said, I did it all so you didn't have to. You don't have to come to me all righteous. In the Old Testament, you had to have something to offer. And you better get your hands washed, and you better offer the blood of bulls and goats. You better do all that, and then you get to go into his presence. But the Lord Jesus said, I tore the temple curtain in two 
from top to bottom, and I said, it's finished. And I told you that no longer do you have to bring me the blood of bulls and goats. You don't have to wash your hands in ritual washing to get into my presence. He said, it's the reverse now. I say, come into my presence, and I'll clean you up. You're red. Red with sin stain, scarlet, crimson. I'm going to make you white like wool, like snow. I'm going to do the cleansing. But I'm saying, come now. Stop waiting. Stop withholding. Stop resisting. Who else needs to come to God? Hebrews 4.16, those who need mercy, grace, help, who have a need. Hebrews 4.16, let us therefore, why? Because Jesus is our priest, let us therefore come how? I'm just going to be all, oh, woe is me. No. You know what? It's the one time you're allowed to be cocky. <laughs> and the reason you are is not because of you. You come boldly because you know the throne that you're going to is a throne of grace, not judgment, grace that you might obtain mercy, find grace to help in the time of need. If you need help, if you need mercy, and if you're looking for grace, that tells me you're in trouble. Amen? But Jesus says, you can come boldly to my throne. So I want you to come. Come now. Come if you're tired. Come if you're sin-ridden, sin-laden. Come if you need help. Come if you need some mercy. Come if you need some grace. Come boldly. Who else is on that list? People who need healing. Mark 3, verse 3. My brother-in-law is going to talk about this tonight at healing service. There was a man in the synagogue with a withered hand. And Jesus did something unusual with this man. Usually Jesus went out and touched them. But in Mark 3, 3, Jesus says to this man on the Sabbath day in the synagogue, just for shock value to all those religious Pharisees, he says, get up and come forward. You know what? Some of you and I, maybe we don't have withering hands. We have withering spirits. Maybe your soul is withering. Maybe you're thirsty and dry. Jesus says, get up. I'm not James Brown. Get on up. No. Jesus says, get up and come forward. Get on up. No, get up. Jesus says, rise up. Look to the hills from whence your help cometh. I will look to the north. Jesus says, get up and come forward. When Moses was right at the Red Sea with the Egyptian army closing in, that poor man, he's like, thanks, God. I've got six million Jews with me. Israelites, excuse me. They weren't Jews at that time. Israelites with me. And I'm hemmed in by mountains and hill country, and Red Sea, and these nasty Egyptians. What the heck, God? And God said, what are you talking to me for? God said that. He said, why are you talking to me? Why are you complaining to me? He goes, tell the people, go forward. There's a sea there, God. Are you blind? God said, go forward. And he made a way out of no way. Jesus says, if you're withering, get up and come forward. Get up and come forward. He invites you. So let's go over that list again. Who's on that list? Those who are laboring, who are burdened. Number two, those who have sinned. Number three, if you didn't fit one or two, maybe you're not tired and burned out. Maybe you haven't sinned, but you need some mercy, some grace, some help. Number four, you need healing, spiritual, emotional, or physical. So who's not on that list? Do you see what I'm saying? What God is saying is you and I are on the list, and we have a standing invitation to come, to enter in, to approach him any time, any place, under any circumstance whatsoever, in a world of outlook calendars and conflicts and scheduling. Gail, amen. Our king who is the CEO of all CEOs, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, his name is Jesus, says, come boldly, come now, come anytime, any state, any condition. So who's not on the list? Based on that invitee list, I'll tell you who's missing. The perfect. Come now if you're perfect. He doesn't say that. 
Who else is missing? The blameless, the self-righteous, those who have it all together. He's not inviting them. A religious mindset will tell you you have to observe protocol to get into the presence of God. The presence of God is like intimacy in a marriage. Being a wily veteran of 30 years, no, excuse me, I'm lying, 29 years, 30 years in the church, 29 in marriage, you forget to date one another. You forget to make special events. Okay, some of you are single or widows or widowers or divorced. Let me apply that to Jesus. Your marriage to the Lord Jesus Christ has gotten stale. Whose fault is that? You can't blame the husband in this case because he's Jesus. He says, my door is always open. My ears are always open. Like the prodigal son's father, I come and I run to you and I put the best robe on you when you're stinky before you even took a bath. You know, he said, come quickly and put the robe on my son who was dead. He's now alive. Do you realize that son didn't have a chance to go get cleaned up? He said, give him the best robe now. That's the kind of lavish love of God. So whose fault is it when there's a breakdown in the relationship? Well, in a natural relationship, it can be a number of factors and people, but I tell you this, the core of it is intimacy. People come with baggages in their life that cause them to throw up walls, weird coping mechanisms, because they crave it, because God craves it. And you can't fulfill it outside of God and feel completely fulfilled all the time. You can for a temporary moment, but with God, he says that in my presence is fullness of joy and pleasures at my right hand. Well, we're coming to the end of our time, and I know Patrick needs to do communion, so I want to just say this. What happens when we come into his presence? When you come into his presence, 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, there's a miracle transformation that takes place. It says, but we all, New American Standard Bible, but we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. First John 1 3, 7 says, intimacy is fellowship with him. First John 1 3, 7 says, 1 3 and 7 says, truly our koinonia fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship also with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his sin, son, cleanses us from all sin. Also, in conclusion, what happens in intimacy? Jesus just wants to spend time with you so he can impart his best in your life so that you can go out. Mark 3, 13 through 15, and I promise this is the last verse. And he goes up into a mountain and calls unto him whom he would, and they came unto him. And he ordained twelve that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach, and to have power to heal sickness, and to cast out devils. Jesus called unto him those that he would. They had to respond. They came unto him. He ordained them that they should be with him. And then he sends them out. Do you get that? God extends the initiative. He calls. We respond. What do we respond to? We come to him. And then it says that he might be with us. That's a beautiful passage of scripture. Trevor Harris has done a wonderful job giving exposition on that passage. Jesus called us to be with him first. Then he imparts you into ministry to go out. Today's Communion Sunday. I want to invite my brother-in-law Patrick up. Remember, communion is another word for fellowship, intimacy. It's not just hi, bye, thank you. It's a deep knowing. And we're going to participate today on Communion Sunday in knowing and remembering what Jesus did and who he is. Amen.